Think Tech is the innovation brought by the Technology Plus Finance. But uh, how can the fintech uh, innovations promote the development of the finance? So the next, without further ado, I'd like to invite Atka Paris, has been dedicated uh, in the uh, financial sectors and also the technology sectors for more than 30 years. And uh, he is a very influential figure in the financial sector. So uh, without further ado, I invite Mr. Atka Paris. Over to you. Distinguished authorities and attendees to this conference, good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation. Innovation never stops. The pace is accelerating. And as you can understand, these changes have been happening over the last decades, probably accelerated since the advent of the internet. Once upon a time, any company that wanted to start a project had to think about not only the application to be developed, but also the hardware, the people, the space, air conditioning, and so on. A huge investment. Today, thanks to cloud computing, that becomes a different model. Now you pay as you go. Now you have a menu of options in hardware and software for you to take advantage of. So instead of the period of weeks or months, that any due development had to go through in the past, today you can make some changes. You can only think about the application and then contract everything else for you to start offering new services to your clients quickly. The competition is doing it. So companies today will also need to be at that pace. That's happening today. So major companies today like Microsoft, Huawei, Alibaba, now they offer cloud services that allow you to quickly get to market, quickly bring new services to your clients who are demanding for that. And obviously for you, it becomes more efficient to do so. First of all, many people now are using cell phones, connectivity. Therefore, activities that we used to perform in person, attending a conference, going to the bank, or doing any transaction, for example, now happens to be online. So now that's one factor for this increased data volume. Another one, of course, the richness of the data. Now we're not only using text, now we think about video, conversation, social media, so many different levels of data, obviously, that take more space. And also the number of devices, cell phones, computers, tablets. It's amazing at home how everybody, every member in the family has a screen. And of course, that's increasing the requirements of companies, how you're going to process the data. You need to still get insights. And that's where big data comes into the picture because you still will need to find how you're gonna serve better your customer who are using more data, who are requiring more capabilities, and still who demand also better services and products. Big data plays an important role today to be able to accommodate. And 5G play an important role in only in these two years, since 2019 when 5G was deployed. The volume of data continues growing, and now we have 5G to accelerate that. Latencies, of course, are decreasing. We can get more channels of information at the same time, and that's creating an avalanche of data that is going to be entering systems. And companies will need to think how are we going to be able to process this data. AI comes again to help us because AI thrives on data. The more data we have, the better our models, the more accurate. And the fact that now that we have such volume data means that our models eventually will become better and better. So if you think about self-driving technology, the holy grail is to have zero fatalities, even better than human drivers. We will be able to achieve that goal if we leverage the data. And 5G now it's important to get to that point of full connectivity when a driver is not needed anymore. And the Oroville becomes our mobile living room. $62,670. That's what Bitcoin is today. 
Do you think this is going to stay? Do you think this is sustainable? Personally, I don't think so. Bitcoin is a fact. As many of the other cryptocurrencies available today. However, very smart people are working in this space. People graduating from college, the bright minds are focusing on this technology. And that's what we need to do too. While Bitcoin and many of these cryptocurrencies might pass, it might be a fashion that will go away, let's think about that technology underlying Bitcoin, and in particular, blockchain. That's what is going to stay. And many industries today definitely need some change. And blockchain is going to bring that. In particular, financial services, logistics, healthcare, Ethereum is an excellent example, not only of the currency, the virtual currency, but also the technology underlying it. Because now we're able to create applications in the same way that you have many apps in your phone. You can also prepare, create apps on Ethereum that will allow you to implement smart contracts that eventually will be legally binding. And that's what is going to create a transformation. For example, in financial services, there was a statement a few decades ago by a, uh, an American pioneer in computing, J.C. Arlick Leider. And he proposed at some moment we will witness the convergence of man and machine. So man will eventually become smarter thanks to computers. And computers will become more personable thanks to human touch. So that's what we're witnessing today. Brain activated interfaces are now in place and also in further research. Because we need to think about not only well being of the society's most capable people, but everybody. And when you think about people, for example, who are disabled, who are not able to walk, or who are not able to use their hands, how are they going to be able to use phones, computers? That's where this type of technology comes handy. Because now the research will allow them to be able to control these things to devices that are going to be inserted in their brains. So they won't need to touch anything. They will be able to control technology, to take advantage of technology using this type of convergence devices. That's progress. That's innovation. And my favorite topic, quantum computing. From many of these trends that I mentioned today, I believe that quantum computing is the one that is going to give us the most progress, incredible change for the world. In the last months, we have seen flooding affecting, impacting cities around the world, in America, in China, Germany, India. People perish due to these natural disasters. That's even though supercomputers today are working on weather prediction. How difficult can it be? Very difficult. Very challenging because there are so many variables you need to control that are changing dynamically all at the same time that even the most powerful computers today are not able to estimate the scale of this natural disaster. That's where quantum computing can become helpful. Because quantum computing by nature, thanks to the power of qubits, will be able to control these many combinations, these many variables, these many changes. So using quantum computers, when they become available, hopefully in the next decade, will transform not only technology, but society in general. If you think about the evolution of this technology, of course, we're still early, 1940s, if you think about traditional computers. So there's still a lot of way before we think about deploying this technology in a massive way. That doesn't mean that traditional computers will disappear. It will coexist. I think there are going to be still applications for those traditional computers, but still opening up a new universe of applications for quantum computers. Now, that's the innovation that we see in technology. BCG, a well-regarded consulting company, came up with this ranking. 50 most innovative companies in the world. 
And of course, if you recognize the list, let's only focus on the first 10. I can tell you, innovation is mostly happening in technology. So I can give this statement that top 10 companies in this list are in technology. You might raise your hand and say, wait a minute. Yes, I see there are some big tech names. But I also see Pfizer. What makes Pfizer a tech company? Pfizer was one of the companies that last year focused on developing a new vaccine for COVID-19. They focused on this task and they were able, as many of these companies, to reduce the time frame required to produce a vaccine from typically five to 10 years to less than one year. And that's why we have now access to these vaccines around the world. In order to do so, the company took advantage of prior in digital transformation efforts and also the deployment of AI internally. So when they were testing these vaccines in 40,000 individuals, they were able to do so faster and more efficiently thanks to AI. Thanks to these technologies, Pfizer now technology company working in the healthcare field. And that's the path for most organizations. Technology becomes an important part to your survival. If we look at financial services, this used to be the universe in financial services, a very simple world. When it was easy to find your classification, you were whether in banking, you were in insurance, or you were in securities. Very simple. However, today, there is a change. Because now, many of the biggest tech companies in the world now are entering financial services. What are Google, Apple, Facebook doing in payments? What a surprise. So if you think about these companies, they come to financial services from different angles. For example, Microsoft, Google, they come from the operations side. They provide, let's say, cloud computing to financial services companies, and they see the potential to expand. Another approach would be Facebook that have access to 2.5 billion records of users. So they come from the customer facing side and they see that clients who trust Facebook would be potentially willing to share their financial information and eventually to take advantage of services provided by Facebook. So the, the field, the point of touch, it's gonna be different, but nonetheless, these companies, technology companies that are so good at managing data feel that at the end of the day, delivering financial services becomes a data gate. The more data you have, the better appreciation of your client's profile. So if, when you think about clients who definitely share their information in social media, who share the information of their shopping activity with JD.com, for example, these companies now get access to a universe of data that allows them to price risk, to offer financial services, a province of activities that used to be constrained only to financial services companies. And that's a risk for financial services companies, of course. So this transformation will bring efficiency. And let me give you a brief example. When you buy a book on Amazon or any major retailer, who makes money? Well, Amazon, yes. The seller, if it's not Amazon, they make some money too, 1% or less than 1%. But who makes the most money? The credit card company, because they charge between two to three percent. And that's still a lot in the last decades. Compare that to WeChat Pay. How much do we pay to buy things on WeChat Pay? Zero. Zero. Of course, some transactions will require some payment, but most of the time it's gonna cost us zero. So what do we think about this transformation? That we need to adapt a new approach. And that's the VC approach. This is, of course, as we've seen in some examples before, explore deals. They invest in companies and they negotiate deals and they eventually exit. That's something that can, we can take advantage of. 
Because this is not only looking at what's happening out there. This is participating in this transformation through their participation as directors, as leaders, advisors, and recruiting management. So while they are looking out there in the space, they can see that they can also help transform the industry. And this transformation is going to be because this is something that can also be replicated in the regulatory space. It's not I'm waiting for tech companies to come to me. I can cooperate with them, and I can see how I can help them to define new technologies, to see where there are regulatory gaps, for example, where we can learn together about new technologies and then anticipate a potential impact in regulation. So while it's true that technology is driving financial innovation, financial reform, the opposite can also be true. This can be a two-way street when also financial reform, financial regulation can drive technology innovation. That's what VCs are doing, and they're so great at it. A uh, few years ago, I published a book on what happened on the flash crash when 10% of the stock exchanges fell down. That's something that regulators could have prepared for. How? Creating records, creating systems. And unfortunately, that's still not the case in some parts of the world. Let me conclude by indicating that there is really a challenge for us to work on these areas. Because at the end of the day, financial technology, fintech, is vital for people and for companies. What can a person do without a bank account? What can a business do without credit? And unfortunately today, 9% of the population still live in extreme poverty. So we know how critical it's going to be financial inclusion. When we have to think about expanding this service to the 2 billion people out there who don't even have any banking or financial service. We owe it to the 2 billion kids out there. Thank you very much.